Good stuff. Hello, everybody. How are you? Woo, good stuff. Yes, hi, hi. Welcome. Come on in. Have a seat. Relax. Be at your leisure. Uh, are we allowed to take photos? Yes. Yeah? Okay. I wanna, while we're all here, well, some of us are here. <clears throat> hmm. Ah, good. Okay. While some of us are here and the rest of you are coming in, I want to get a quick selfie. I'm just so excited. Look at that. We're here all together. Uh, and we're going to, you know, it'll be fun. It'll be fine. So let's take a photo. My friends, my name is Josh Long. I work on the spring team. It's so great to be here with you today. Uh, just thanks for coming. Thank you all for being here. Um, we have a, a lot of stuff to cover until very little time to do it. And so I'm hoping we can get a quick photo. Uh, and please. Okay. So on my marks, when I say uh, smile or open source, whatever, you say open source, and then we'll take a photo. Is that okay? Does that work for everybody? Good stuff. Good stuff. I am so excited. Okay. Everybody pretend like you're happy. Okay. Ready? <laughs> Steady. Open source. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. I had to get like three. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to do what my friend Chris Richardson, uh, uh, you know, said he does, which is I'm going to take that photo, and I'm going to show it to my daughter and say, see, they listen to me. I, I think that's a great way to use these photos. Thank you so much for this. My friends, my name is Josh Long. Like I said, I work on the Spring Team. I'm a Kotlin Google developer expert, a Java champion, and most importantly, I'm at your service. So should you have questions, comments, feedback, tomatoes, whatever, find me on the line. I'm very online, whatever that means. I have a, a YouTube channel right there. It's called At Coffee Software, YouTube.com, At Coffee Software. It's not great, but it, you know, you could do worse, right? Um, statistically, it's probably not the worst mistake you'll make today. Uh, so find me there. It's fun. It's a good conversation. I don't see you all subscribing. What's going on? Okay. No pressure. I'm also on the, the bird website. And if that thing burns down, then I'm on Mastodon, you know, hedging my bets. You know, it's 2023. You never know. Uh, so there's good. My friends, we're going to talk about Spring Boot 3. And there's a lot to talk about here, right? Spring Boot 3 was released. Uh, <laughs> it's actually a very big release. It's the biggest, in my mind, in my estimation, it's the biggest release of Spring Boot since 1.0. 1.0 came out on April Fool's 2014, the GA version, right? A holiday, very big one. Uh, and of course, this latest release, Spring Boot 3.0, came out last year uh, on Thanksgiving, which is a day that we celebrate absolutely nothing at all, really. It's just a Thursday, never mind. <laughs> nothing here. It's just nothing to see here. Moving on. Um, uh, and yeah, it's just, a, it's, just a, it's just a really big release, and there's a lot of new opportunities and a lot of new potential. And so I really just want to kind of cover all that stuff as best as we can. And as always, to do that, we're going to go here to my second favorite place on the internet, my first favorite place. Who knows what it is? Thank you. Very well done. Good job. Ha Randall, cl clappies. Come on, clappies. Very good. Good job. Production. Amazing. It's my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place, obviously, is production. Here, my friends, we have some choices. First, what build tool we do we want to use? Uh, friends, we defaulted the build to uh, Gradle, which I, it's fine. I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm, this year, I made a New Year's resolution. I'm going to uh, lose some weight and learn Gradle, and I'm, and I'm definitely learning Gradle. It's going well. So, so there's that. Uh, and, uh, and then we have to choose what version of Spring Boot we want to use. I'm going to take a bit of a risk. <clears throat> I'm going to use 3.1. RC2. Okay, this is just this is very new. We'll see. It'll be fine. And then we have the choice of what version of software. Uh, what, what, no, sorry, the name of the software that we're going to build. What do we want to call it? Right. I'm going to call it Service. And the reason we're going to do that is because I'm really good with names. Just amazing with names. I get that from my father. My father. We had a little white dog that showed up at our door when I was a boy. And my dad, my father, he named it White Dog. <laughs> and then, and then. And then, like, 10 years later, that dog disappeared. I don't know. He went, up to, went to a farm upstate or something. I don't know, right? And he, he disappeared, and there's another, miraculously, another small white dog that appeared at our door. And so my father, in his infinite wisdom, named it Two. <laughs> like, I'm not sure if it was T-W-O or T-O-O. Either way, my mom insists. She reminds me all the time how lucky I am that she named me a little white baby. What do you think that would have been? I'm just, I'm, anyway, I'm great with names. I get that from my dad. So we're going to call this a service, okay, friends? Then we have down here some choices around which version of Java we want to use. Friends, while it might seem like there are four choices here, I'll just be, I'll be straight with you, friends. Two of them are just for the lulls, just for the memes, right? These are choices that you could make. But two of which are some that you should, never, you should absolutely never make. These last two are just here for the lulls, right? 
Java 17 is a required baseline to use Spring Boot 3.0 and later, okay? So you have to use this new version. Now, of course, that might seem a tad aggressive, but consider the, the timeline, right? Extrapolate forward. If Spring Boot 3 is out for as long as Spring Boot 2.0, which supported Java 8, was more than five years, then you'll be able to write code, given the current time, you know, the cadence at which Java gets new releases, you'll be able to write code against Java 29 by the time we do the next thing, right? Like, it'll be, you'll seem very silly writing code against Java 17 when people are writing code against Java 29 on the same generation, right? So don't do that. Uh, Java 17 is the current baseline. But remember, it's already out of date. Java 21 is near. It's imminent, right? We're already at Java 20. Uh, Java 21 is down the stream, down the street. So we have a lot of good choices. But just remember, Java 17 is a great release. It's a great release. Java 17 and later have just an amazing releases. They are technically superior to these other two versions. They're technically superior to Java 8 and later, uh, or sorry, earlier in every single way. They're faster, more performant, more syntax-rich, more operations-friendly, more container-ready. They're also morally superior. <laughs> you won't like the look of sadness and chagrin in your children's eyes when they find out that you're using Java 8 in production. Don't do it. Be the change you want to see in the world. Do the right thing. OK? Do the right thing. So choose 17 or later. Uh, you could choose. Like I said, you could choose these, but these are never acceptable. They're what I call non-choices. That's not, that's not just an Indian bread, my friends. That's a choice that you should never, ever make, unless you want to ironically suggest what not to do, right? So I'll leave it as it is. And then, friends, we have choices about what version and what thing we want to add. So we're going to add the GraalVM native image support. We're going to add uh, uh, Postgres. We're going to add the uh, dev tools. We're going to add the uh, test container support. We're going to add the Spring Boot actuator. Uh, and we're going to add the web support. So I've got uh, Postgres. I've got dev tools, test containers, actuator, web. I want Spring Data JDBC. Right? We're going to add that as well. So I've got just a number of things here which we're going to use to build our application. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and open this up in my, in my IDE. And it doesn't all that much matter what IDE you use, so long as it supports the version of Java and the build tool of your choice, which in this case are both well cared for. So friends, first things first. I'm going to be using a new feature in Spring Boot 3.1, which is not out yet. We just talked about that. We just established it's RC1. Uh, and so it's going to be good, you know, really good built-in support for test containers and Docker Compose. So to that end, I'm going to create a main class in my test code. Okay? So I'm going to call this test service application. Okay? And it's just going to be a, another main class that will delegate to the production code, but that will live and have things that are related to running test containers for development time, OK? So I'll say spring application dot uh, for, I'm sorry, from, from, and we're going to test, uh, we're going to use service application main dot run args, and we're going to have a config file. And that config file will be just this very class in which we're in right now, OK? Uh, so we're going to say with test service application dot class. Uh, and then here, I'm going to point. I'm going to I need a Postgres instance, right? So I'm going to define a bean of type Postgres container, pointing that to that. And I can just call it Postgres 12. Ah, oh, it's so good. Did you see how that it just read? I'm not even using ChatGPT or CodePile or anything. It just knew. It just knew. It's amazing. Uh, service connection. I'm going to tell Spring Boot that this is a way from which it, uh, a means by which it, it can source the credentials for a, uh, a connection to a Postgres database. And of course, I want this connection. I want this um, this uh, this bean this co this container to endure beyond restarts. I don't want it to get I don't want it to get reset every single time. So in order to do that, uh, I'm going to make this test implementation. Okay. Command Shift I to bring that dependency in, and I'm going to use uh, one more thing, which is the restart scope annotation. Okay, so I'm going to run everything from here, uh, but I've got Dev Tools, I've got my application running. Oh, I don't have a semicolon. Awkward. Okay, here we go, up, up, and away. Okay, there's our application. It'll take a little while. It's going to download things. It's up and running. It's fine. Now, what I want to do, friends, is I want to build an application uh, that manages data. And of course, this is just a, you know, nothing here is particularly new. You've seen this stuff before, right? So I'll, I'll create an entity. Uh, I love. This, fin this feature, Java Records, right? I just love it. I love it. I love it so much. Uh, it's just an amazing, amazing, <laughs> amazing way to build software, OK? We're going to have a, a repository. It's going to extend the CRUD repository. Not that. CRUD repository, uh, managing entities of type integer, a uh, customer whose primary, type, primary keys of type integer. I want to have some data in the database. So again, pretty standard, stock standard stuff here. We're just going to create a, a schema file here, right? So schema.sql, uh, create table customer. ID, serial, primary key, name, whoop, 
name Varkar, 255, not null. Very good, right? A very simple schema. Uh, obviously, we're, do, we're using a durable thing, so I'll say if it doesn't exist, uh, then you know, create it. We also want some data, so I'll create a data file here, data.sql. Insert into customer name, and I'm just going to put some people that are on the Spring team, okay? Some people on the Spring team. So hi, that's me. One of them is, the, is me. We've got uh, uh, the good, the great, the amazing Dr. Sire. We've got uh, Phil. Uh, we've got, who else is amazing? And, uh, yeah, of course, uh, Madura, of course. We've got, uh, we've got uh, Violetta, of course. We've got Yushin. We've got uh, Stefan, right? We've got a few names there. There's eight names, uh, and so that's going to work just fine. And then finally, when the application starts up, maybe I'll have a, a little bean that will uh, listen for the uh, new, uh, you know, it'll listen for the startup event, and when it happens, we're going to interact with our repository and just print everything out, okay? Nothing too s fancy here, nothing too special here. I just wanted to, like, have something with which we can work. And then finally, I also want to create an HTTP controller, okay? So we'll create a controller. Uh, class customer HTTP controller, and it's going to be, uh, I'm not going to call it a REST controller. I don't want to offend anybody uh, with that, so it's just a HTTP controller. Please don't at me. Um, and, uh, you know, we're just going to create a little thing here to have some data, inject that into the constructor, customers, collection of customer, customers. Very good. So this dot repository at find all. Fantastic. Okay, this is going to be an iterable. Um, iterable. Okay, very good. So there's this, uh, you know, hit Command F9. So that, what that's going to do is I've got a little HTTP endpoint, localhost uh, customers. Oh, I don't have the uh, SQL. Or I, I don't have the um, customer. Oh, I have to tell the thing to initialize the database, right? So, of course, init always. It's not just an embedded database right now. I have to tell it to, to do that. So Command F9 again, uh, and then restart. Okay. Good. There's our data. It worked. Of course it worked. <laughs> it was a demo. That was always going to work. It's not all that interesting. We just built a regular simple application. Not a big deal. What we want is to have an application that is production worthy. And so to that end, we're going to introduce a few nice features in Spring Boot 3.x that I think will help get us there. First and foremost, I want to make my code, uh, you know, let's say I have another endpoint here, right? An endpoint uh, that gives us the data by name, right? Name. So iterable customer by name, like this. Uh, and I'll say path variable string name. OK, and I'll return that. And I'll say uh, by name, return this dot repository dot find by name, passing in the name. Voila, I'm going to just implement that there. There we go, Get adding a method to the repository to support a custom query. Um, OK, so now suppose I wanted to go, uh, what's a name in here? I guess I can just do, well, let's just say I do myself, my, my own name there. Did that, uh, uh, uh? what did I do? Is it, uh, oh, customers. OK, restart, compile, OK, there we go. So there's the, uh, there's the thing, OK, there's my data. I've got the data thrice at this point, so let me uh, update the data.sql, no, data.sql. It was, oh, remember, remember that time a minute ago when I said it was so impressive what IntelliJ was doing? I take it back. <laughs> Delete from customer, please. I mean, sure, it's a, definitely a me problem here, but I, I want that to not do that. Okay, very good. There's our data. It worked. I want to make our code just that much more production worthy. So one thing I might want to do is for this endpoint, I might have an assertion. I might say, hey, state, I want to make sure that the first character uh, in this string, uh, you know, um, is, 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 is an uppercase, right? Uppercase character. So is uppercase. And, you know, it's going to, you know, the name must start with a, va uh, with a uppercase letter, okay? Or letter. I don't know. Which one do you do here? R-E? E-R? Okay, good. Okay, so there's this. Uh, what's going to happen if that's invalid? Well, it's going to throw in a legal state exception. So again, in the interest of being more production worthy, I'm going to create a, um, a controller advice, okay? A component that just sits there, error handling controller advice, okay? And one thing I want to do is I want to, uh, uh, you know, collect all the exceptions for this, uh, all the uh, errors that happen for this particular exception and handle them in some way, right? I can get a reference to the exception. Uh, now, I want to have a representation of the errors that's consistent, that's, that's consistent. I've heard in, there's a hypothetical situation. I've never seen it yet, but it's hypothetically possible, it's conceptually possible that there are people out there building applications on the JVM 
or, or sorry, there are people out there building applications not on the JVM and not using Spring Boot. It's like the scientists from a few years ago, they were having trouble uh, proving the existence of the Higgs boson particle. It's conceptually possible, but we'd never seen it. Now, if that's the case, I want to have a consistent representation of my errors. Right now, I'll get a Spring Boot proprietary sort of endpoint. And to that end, there's actually a very nice RFC called Problem Details. Is this, is this a big deal? No, but it's nice and nice to have it. And it's in Spring Boot uh, 3 and Spring Framework 6. So I'll go ahead and enable that. OK, very good. Problem Details, right? Enabled equals true. And what that allows me to do is to capture and return this representation of the error, right? So Problem Details, like that, for status, HTTP status code dot bad request dot code or value return pd and I might want to like associate a message with it okay so there's the ise dot get message there we go very good look at that now we have this nice consistent representation of the error um, let's just go ahead and try that out uh, go to the command line here curl http localhost uh, 8080 forward slash customers capital J, that works just fine. What about lowercase j? We got this nice error, and this is in the problem details style. Very good. Small thing, but it's nice. Another thing I might want to do, friends, is capture the context associated with that request. And I can do that by injecting the current HTTP servlet request. I don't know what you do here. Maybe you get the header names and just uh, visit each one and just print it out. I mean, there's not really, I don't really care. But what's interesting here is this. This package has changed. Did you see this? This is a big deal, even though it doesn't seem like one. You see, Spring Framework 6 and Spring Boot 3 now require you to use Jakarta EE. If you're using those types, you need to be using Jakarta EE. There was a time, I don't know, five years ago, half a decade ago, some time ago, when uh, Oracle just kind of ghosted the community. Anybody here remember that? There was, yeah, it wasn't great. It was, uh, you know, things happen, I suppose. But anyway, the result was after like six months or some time, uh, you know, they finally came back to the table just long enough to open source, to make it truly open. They open sourced the Java EE stuff, and so they moved it to the Eclipse Foundation. But of course, it was never, nothing's ever simple. So as part of that, there's a stipulation that any changes to these APIs, be it a method deletion or addition or a new type or whatever, had to be done in a new package. That's a political problem, friends, that we had to deal with, and we can only deal with in terms of technology. Now, to their endless credit, our friends over at the Eclipse Foundation did an amazing job. They released Jakarta EE8, which is exactly the same as 7, except that there's now new documentation and new TCK. Then they released Jakarta EE9, which is exactly the same as 8, except that they now have the new package. And this has meant that we've had like half a decade to sort of on-ramp to these new types, which is good because the community needed that to deal with every line of code ever written against these types suddenly breaking overnight. Right? Now, what does this mean for you? It means that we did a lot of work with the community to sort of make all this stuff work. You can imagine what it was like. We moved to these new types, and suddenly all these integrations in the Spring ecosystem just went red, right? Not great. The community is amazing, though. They did amazing work. And, the, and you know, we, have, we, we, we work on the Apache Tomcat project. That had to get changed. I mean, all sorts of stuff had to get changed in response to this. Hopefully, you won't notice it. If you're using Spring MVC, it's entirely possible. You are not depending on anything, on, on anything directly like the HTTP server request. But of course, if you're using JPA or Bean validation or something like that, you might notice it. Because of the incredible efforts of the Eclipse Foundation, hopefully, hopefully, my friends, this will just be the worst find and replace of your life. And that's it. Just an afternoon with egrep, and you'll be fine, right? Hopefully. Uh, then I would, be, I would be very surprised if your tools don't have like a, a big, that was easy button. You know, that just fixes it for you, right? I would be very surprised. It'll, it's probably going to be fine. And this is a really good thing, actually, because it means that now these technologies are in place where they can evolve more readily, OK? So it's actually a good thing, but we do need to understand that that's a new change in Spring Boot 3 and Spring Framework 6. So good. We've got our uh, exception handling, like error handling. What about observability? I want to support observability. Observability is a very simple idea. It's this idea that when I get my application into production, I need to be able to understand how it's doing by its outputs. Okay, and historically, observability is actually two different things, right? It's uh, uh, you know, there's tracing and metrics, right? And observability before, for metrics, was supported by this thing uh, called uh, metrics were supported by this thing called micrometer, and then Spring Framework depended on mic micrometer, and Spring Boot, Boot depended on Spring Framework, and then Spring Cloud on top of that, and then Spring Cloud Sleuth supported tracing on top of that. Okay, now this is a bit of an asymmetrical sort of thing, right? 
It meant that we couldn't have code lower, up in, lower down in the stack that did distributed tracing without creating a, a, a sort of a, a, a circular sort of dependency, right? Spring Cloud Sleuth can't, uh, sorry, Spring Boot can't depend on Spring Cloud Sleuth, which in turn depends on Spring Boot. Do you see the problem? So this has been rectified in Spring Boot 3. We got rid of Sleuth, and now the tracing support and the metric support both live here. And there's a new unified API that you can use as well. So observation dot, I'm going to create, a, I'm going to wrap this action in a observation, this new unified API for observability. Uh, in order to make it work, I need to inject a pointer to the observation registry. And I'll inject those into the constructor. Go, go, go. OK, good. This dot registry. And I'll uh, return this. OK, very simple. So here we are. Very good. Look at that. Very, very nice. So we've got this new observation API. I'm, I'm creating a metric. You know, Every time this endpoint gets called, I'll have this custom metric. And if I were to initiate a call to another service using Kafka or the web client or whatever, and if I had enabled distributed tracing, then that would be either initiated here or propagated if it was already in, in flight. Okay? All of that would happen with inside, within this observe call. Okay? So I want to see that in action. That's all supported through the Spring Boot actuator. So I'll enable a few things here. My Kubernetes probes. I'll enable the health details. I'll, uh, the, uh, I want to expose all the endpoints. Uh, and I'll just go ahead and restart that as well. Or I'm going to recompile the code, I suppose, is what I meant to say. So actuator, uh, health. There is the you know health, good stuff there. Metrics. And you can see there's no mention of our by name thing here. So we go to customers. Josh, and I'm just going just gonna to really refresh this as fast as I can. And there I've got now this new metric called by name. Okay? Uh, and so I can go to that, and I can say, OK, metrics forward slash by name. And I can see that I made 19 calls and, and so on. OK, very good. Nice unified API. There are integrations with Micrometer uh, and any number of different uh, metrics tools and uh, distributed tracing tools, be it uh, Prometheus and OpenTelemetry and uh, Google Cloud Stack Driver Trace and StatsD and Wavefront and whatever. Same thing for distributed tracing. OpenTelemetry or OpenZipkin, all supported well out of the box. Okay, so we've got our observable and er you know consistent error handling production-worthy application. I think it's time to start thinking about actually making a trip to production. And friends, here, the first thing people are going to ask is, how do I take this application and turn it into an OCI image or a container? And friends, that's a, that's a question you, I don't want to have to answer more than once. The answer is, you don't. You let something else do it for you, like build packs. Okay? Build packs are a Cloud Native Computing Foundation technology. They're a great way to take an application artifact, be it a, Rub be it a Ruby on Rails app, or a Java jar, or a .war, or a .NET EXE, or a Python application, or a Node.js application, or a P. 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 I can't say it. It's not a language I refuse. But anyway, it'll, it'll take all those things and containerize it for you. Remember, friends, friends don't let friends write Docker files. Don't do it. Don't do it. You're going to get it wrong. Remember, nobody's going to come to you late on a Friday night and put their hands on your shoulder and say, well done. Really, congratulations. Way to write the best Docker file ever. <laughs> Nobody cares. Don't do it. You're going to get it wrong. It'll be insecure and flawed tomorrow. And in the meantime, you've got more things to maintain. No, use build packs. They are recipes for containerizing applications that are provided by the people who have you know, decades of, of, of experience running things in production, OK? Good. So this is not a new feature. I just want to point it out. It's out there. There's a support in Spring Boot already for years uh, that you can use. And so if you're using Gradle, you just say uh, um, build boot image, right? Or if you're using uh, Maven, you would say Maven W Spring Boot colon build hyphen image. And that would just do its thing, and it would come back a, little, you know, a few seconds, like 30 seconds, with a, a Docker container that you can then Docker tag and Docker push to your container registry of choice. Good stuff. The next thing, my friends, that I care about is making my application as efficient and scalable as possible. And it's here, it's here, friends, that I think we need to just you know, cut down on the hype a little bit. Just, let's, let's just be very clear. Java is already really, really good. Right? It's already really good. It's a very, very, very efficient, powerful, scalable language, right? Uh, and and the, this is borne out by this amazing uh, blog from like 2018, which looks at uh, normalized global results for energy, time, and memory, okay, for different languages. And so naturally, uh, C fares quite well here. Let's say that it's the baseline for energy usage, right? Uh, it's, it's the baseline 1.0. Rust, you know, doing quite well as well. Uh, C++, a little bit worse, which is... OK, I guess. Ada, but you know, who cares? Moving on. Uh, and, then, and then Java, right? And Java is, Java is 
not even, let's just call it tudado, okay, for simple math. Let's just say it's twice as inefficient as C, all right? Not bad, but look at where the other languages land, right? Uh, here's C sharp, 3.14. Here's Go. Anybody tells you that Go is a more efficient thing? It's not, right? It's just not. And then, and then you've got things like JavaScript. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, and TypeScript. By the way, look at this. What's going on here? How does, how's that? How, what? I thought this turned into this. How can this be five times worse-ish, or four times worse? Okay, not great. These two, yeah, I mean, no surprise. Moving on. Um, and look, I love Python. This makes me sad in my heart. This is just, what is this, 33, 33 times more inefficient than Java? It's not great. We can do better. Right, okay. So Java's already very scalable, very energy efficient, very fast. I love uh, Java. It's just an, an amazing job of making my code do better things in production year after year without me being particularly qualified to take credit for it, okay? So I'm a big fan. It's able to do this for, for, with two different... Oh, yeah. All right. Good stuff. Hiya. <laughs> all right. It's able to do this in two different ways. One, one uh, thanks to two different things. One, one of the things that it does is it has a, uh, an amazing garbage collector. The Java garbage collector is phenomenal, right? It's, uh, we take it for granted now, but it allows me to create lots of garbage, and it just does the right thing, right? Thank you, Java garbage collector. That said, that said, I think we all need to be very clear. I don't think it's fair that it has credit for being the first Java garbage collector. There are others. Case in point, this is one of the more original Java garbage collectors. Uh, she's a product manager from uh, FanHouse and all that, but she's also from the island of Java, Indonesia, and she collects garbage. Okay? Yeah, yeah. I think we just have to be very clear about what happened there. Now, what I love about this tweet, and the reason, oh, look, it's got, <laughs> as I've been talking to people about this tweet, uh, I, I noticed it, it keeps, it's not me, obviously, I'm just saying over time, more and more people find this tweet surreptitiously, and their, their likes inc improve. Basically, almost 20,000 people around the planet are on, that's the Venn diagram between geography, Indonesia, garbage, and the JVM. That humor, right? <laughs> that humor is right there. That's, the, that's all of us that appreciate that joke. So that's one thing. That's one thing, okay? The, the Java programming language garbage collector is a um, phenomenal piece of technology. The other thing that makes Java so darned scalable, right, uh, besides the garbage collector, is the just-in-time compiler, which is another miracle piece of technology. The just-in-time com compiler sits there, and uh, it runs in the background, kind of monitoring your code. And if you're doing something that doesn't do anything particularly dynamic, anything that doesn't take advantage of the, the runtime that Java has, then it can take that code and turn it into operating system and architecture-specific native code. And this is a good deal, right? Large organizations like Google and Alibaba, they take advantage of this effect. They put software out, they warm it up, and then that thing incurs the, the just-in-time compiler, and then that gets deployed and actually let loose on production traffic. It allows their code to run at really good speeds, right? While technically, us, you know, our language is still technically an interpreted language, we can get very, very good performance on par with a lot of these other languages thanks to that just-in-time compiler. The question then is, well, if that's such a good idea, why don't we just proactively turn the whole thing into a, into a native image, right? That's a good point. But remember that aforementioned runtime. That runtime has been there since day one. It's one of the reasons why Java is so, so powerful, right? For all of its uh, syntax warts and its stodgy sort of approach to uh, program design, it's actually a very dynamic language, having a lot more in common with the likes of Lua and Ruby and Python and JavaScript and whatever than the likes of like C, for example. Right? It's got, because it's got this runtime. You can, after a fashion, create a Java Lang string at runtime in your Java code that's compiled and already running. You can have a Java Lang string which has as its contents the source code for a class file, let's say class cat or something like that, class cat curly bracket curly bracket. You can take that Lang, Java Lang string, compile it, write it to a file system as a dot .class file, it, uh, load it into the class loader, reflectively invoke methods on that, create an instance of it, right? You can serialize it if, if it implements serializable, sending it over the network. You can uh, create a JDK proxy out of it if it's an interface. You can do all that after the program has started up and is running, right? Kind of like eval in lots of other languages. Really, really dynamic. But all of this eludes the, the sort of compiler, right? The thing that needs to turn our code into native code. So we need to account for this stuff. And we can account for it with configuration. Lots of configuration. 
Lots and lots. And the way we can do that is by using an amazing tool called uh, the GraalVM Native Image Compiler. The GraalVM Native Image Compiler allows you to take your uh, application and if you furnish this configuration, to turn it into a native image. It's phenomenal, right? In Spring, one of the big things in Spring Boot 3 and Spring, Boot, Spring Framework 6 and later is we have this new support for creating this configuration, which then gets fed into the GraalVM native image compiler. So I'll go ahead and kick off a GraalVM native image build, right? Native compile. We're going to let that do its thing in the background, but it does take a while, OK? It takes a little while. And if I'm honest with you, with you friends, it takes long enough that, frankly, it just kind of, I, I get kicked out of the zone, right? It, it's, not, it's long enough that I, get, I lose track of what's happening, but it's not long enough that uh, you know, I can do something useful. It's not like I can go take a walk. Or, uh, or, or anything like that. In fact, I'm finally in that club of people that understand this joke. I never understood this comic before, but now I'm there. I'm one of these people. I get it. The number one programmer excuse for legitimately slacking off, my code's compiling, right? That's me now. I get that joke. I never understood. Who were these people that had languages that took so long to compile that this was their life? I'm now one of them. And it's long enough that I get kicked out of the zone, but it's not long enough that I can do something useful. Like I said, you can't like, uh, talk to somebody in Slack or have a, a cup of coffee or use the restroom or whatever. So you're just kind of stuck there, waiting and waiting and waiting. And, and it just, eventually, if I'm honest with you, friends, I started to hear elevator music. And this elevator music, you know, I, I, I want others to hear the elevator music. So, so I went to the... So I went to the, I went to the GraalVM project and I said, would you please play elevator music during the native image <laughs> compilation process? And, and I said, I already hear elevator music in my head while I do these sometimes long running compilations. I'd just like everybody else to hear it too. Thank you in advance and I appreciate your amazing work. And by the way, I do. They really are doing something very special for all of us and I really appreciate it. And so, so you know, Got some great uh, responses here from our friend. One of them appears to be from one of our friends at Red Hat, uh, linking to this. This is a, uh, a uh, anybody remember the Pierce Brosnan, uh, James Bond outing from the 90s? Apparently, there was, this is for the video game. So this is the soundtrack for the video game, uh, and it's elevator music. I'm not going to play it. You can, you can find it on the YouTubes, right? It's there. Um, and it, actually, it's, really, it's a good fit. I think that would be a good fit. Somebody else said, hey, would, uh, I would add that using beeps in general, not only for native images, uh, really helped reduce the development time. And that's a great point, right? That's a super good point. Like, my, my flippin' toaster can give me a beep or a ding when it's done, right? Why can't my million line compiler, you know? It feels like that's not a big deal. That would be a great step forward. I was really excited about that. And this response was the best, right? Uh, a gentleman named Fabio Niepaus, I'm sorry if I'm butchering the name, really nice. He's a researcher on the GraalVM team at Oracle, uh, and He's a previously, you know, he's a doctor, PhD, one of my new favorite doctors, along with Doctors Who, Strange, Seuss, Supermanium, and Sire. Uh, <laughs> he uh, is previously at Google Colab and Mat Matan Guitars, and uh, he left this great response. He says, thank you for the feature request, Josh. The problem with playing music uh, during the compilation process is that it's just fixing the symptoms, and we've been and are still working on the cause, making GraalVM native images more efficient in terms of time, memory, and CPU consumption. He continues. Anyway, I have prototyped a dash dash Josh Long mode. <laughs> and that's this right here, the dash dash Josh Long mode for GraalVM native images. Uh, and so basically what, we, what would happen was you'd go, you know, forward slash you know, native image, dash dash Josh Long mode, hello world. And then it would say music brought to you by Josh Long. That's me. And then, and then it would show you, you know, me. That's the future I want to live in. I don't know about you. <laughs> it, anyway, he continues. But for some reason, I have the feeling my PR will be rejected, probably because of copyrighted music. Oh. On a more serious note, we could add a dash dash ring bell when done option that prints the bell code after the compilation process. So that's a win, right? That's a win. Power of open source, people. Aren't you excited? I am. This is a good life. We're doing good. OK. Uh, anyway, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, I think the build's probably done, right? It's probably done. <laughs> sure hope so. OK, here we go. Yes, sure is. OK, so there's our, our build. 
Now, it's in the, uh, I don't know, where is it? It's in the build folder, native, native compile, okay? There it is. Uh, but I, I don't have any, I'm not pointing it to a database, right? So I'm going to go ahead and run up, uh, run a actual uh, Postgres instance here. I'll say docker compose up. I've got this instance, okay? Cat this, docker compose file. And the username, password, and, and uh, uh, DB are all BP. So I've got a script here called run.sh, right? All that's going to do is expose these environment variables pointing uh, to this local host Docker Compose instance and then running this service in this directory, OK? So I'm going to call that script here to run it, OK? Oh, it's, uh, oh, is the actual thing running? Oh, yeah, I forgot to stop it here, didn't I? Sorry, drats, OK. Take two. There we go. There we are, huh? It worked. Of course it worked. Really fast, like 100 plus milliseconds if you're, uh, uh, you know, if, you're, um, wanna, if you care about serverless, and that's great for you. Uh, this is good. It's good for serverless. I don't care, actually, if I'm honest about that part. What I care about is this, right? I care about this little bit right here. Um, that's the process identifier, 4290. And, uh, and then I'm going to just look at the RAM, so PSO, RSS. 4290. That's about 100 megs, 109 megs, whatever, of RAM, which is a good deal, friends. That's less than Slack. It's a lot less than Slack. I, w I went to a data center about 20 years ago, and I ran through the... Uh, anybody remember data centers? I don't know. Some of you may not know. There were, there were these giant buildings, refrigerators with computers in them, and you'd go in there with a jacket, and you could see your own breath, and you'd put in uh, patch cables into these racks full of computers. So I went into there, and I plugged in these ca patch cables, checking, logging into each of these machines, and uh, checking the RAM of all the deployed applications at the time. Back then, uh, application servers roamed the earth. And so we'd, I'd log in and I'd put these, uh, I'd, I'd check the RAM, and yeah, each one was taking about two gigs of RAM because we had an application server with one application, right? Multi-tenancy and application servers never really worked. So even, we knew even then you should just put one app per application server, but we still needed the application server because we needed the infrastructure. So we deployed both and uh, we, you know, it took about two gigs. And we wanted more. That's the thing that was so sick, was we wanted more RAM. I remember thinking, gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could allocate even more RAM? And of course, this is before we had 64-bit uh, uh, computers, right, and JVMs, right? So back then, it was all 32-bit. Now you can. You can actually allocate and address more. But back then, you'd get these uh, really not fun, uh, you know, pause the world garbage collection pauses when you tried to work with more than two gigs of RAM. So if you would told me 20 years ago that I'd be 20 years hence and I'd be able to, <laughs> I'd be able to like get it all in, going in like 100 megs or something, I don't know if I'd believe you, but it worked. Here we are. Good stuff. So now we've got our service, start.spring.io. Let's go back and build a new thing called a client, again, because I'm really great with names. And uh, we're going to build an uh, application that talks to the service that we just built, okay? Um, and, um, you know, I think we can, what else do I have? I've got Gra GraphQL, Gateway, Reactive Web. I think that's it. That'll be enough. Oh, maybe we want the GraalVM support. No reason not to, but, okay, hit generate. All right, CD downloads, UAO, client.zip. And what we're going to do is we're going to build an application that just talks to the service and just gets the data and makes it available to the outside world. And so here, uh, it's going to be an edge service, if you will. It's a thing that will listen on port 99 or 9090 or something like that. And this application is going to talk to the downstream service. Now, I could actually build a client, right, customer, uh, client, and I could do that. And I could inject the reactive web client. I could do that as well. I could do all sorts of things here. But that sounds suspiciously like work. <laughs> Not a fan. So instead, uh, I'm going to write an interface, right, customer, client, and create a method here that returns all the customers, OK, by talking to the service that we just built. Now, of course, I don't have this type here, so I'm going to do something terrible, something that you should never, ever do, ever, not even when you're all by yourself at home and no one is looking. I'm going to copy and paste code. <laughs> Here's this. So I'll go here, paste that. Good stuff. Good stuff, OK? So now I've got this interface. I could create other definitions here, right? Customer uh, by name, for example, string name. I need to tell Spring how to map these method invocations to invocations to the HTTP service. And so to that end, we have these new annotations called get exchange, right? Customers name, all right? Get exchange, customers, etc. Now, of course, that's a, I can also use some of the service side annotations, but this new annotation is for the client side, okay? And so I've got the definition. Now I just need to you know, create an instance of that uh, interface using the new uh, service proxy factory mechanism in Spring Framework, OK? So uh, we'll say 
First, I need to create a web client, a reactive non-blocking web client. Okay, so I'll inject the web client builder. I'll say builder dot base URL uh, HTTP localhost 8080 dot build. Okay, and I'm going to build a web client adapter like this. WC dot build. Up, 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 up. There we go. There we go. Good. And then I'm going to build a um, there. So HTTP service proxy factory dot um, Builder dot client adapter WCA up, up, up. and uh, and then build and then create the actual client. So most of this you can cache. You only need to do it once per application. You can just reuse it for each interface. But as I've only got one in the application, I'm just doing it all in the same place. Very good. So there's that bean, and now I can just use that as it would anything else. Just inject it into the application like so, uh, and use it when the application starts up to call the downstream service. So let's just in inject that client like we did, all dot uh, subscribe, and just print out the results. Okay, pretty straightforward. Good. So there's our uh, interface. Let's go ahead and run this thing right here. Ah, uh, there we go. It worked. Okay, so that's fine. That's our data. We were able to get to it. We didn't have to write any like network code. This also works for our socket. If you're into our socket, very cool, very flexible. Another way you could connect your uh, downstream clients to the world is if you, especially if you want to act on the envelope of the message itself, you could use an API gateway like Spring Cloud Gateway. So route locator builder, right? Builder. Whoop. There you are. Okay. You can say return b dot routes. Dot build and here you're def you're finding routes that match incoming requests so I'm going to match the request going to port 9090 uh, forward slash proxy and I'm going to send that request onward to localhost loca no no different host local host 8080 now the problem is I'm going to send it to forward slash proxies don't I so I'm going to use a filter to change the incoming request which will match based on this path of a forward slash proxy, I'm going to change the path to customers and then send it to here. So it'll go to the right place as opposed to like customers forward slash proxy or something like that, right? Because the filters are really where the power of Spring Cloud Gateway is, right? I can do that. I can say uh, dot retry. I can do add response header, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff here, right? I can do all sorts of things to make the application just that much more uh, available. I can add uh, security and all, the, all sorts of stuff there, okay? So let's go ahead and restart this one. I want some of this coffee. Ah, very good. So there's the application. Let's go to localhost 9090 forward slash, um, what did we say, proxy? There we are. huh? And if I go here, minus V, paste it, you can see we've got the access control allow origin header. So I was able to introduce new things to the service without changing the downstream service. Great. This is how I act on the envelope. Now, sometimes you might want to act on the payload. Sometimes you might want to create a new view of the data that is distinct from the, the implementation and the manifestation of that data in the downstream services. And so this is the same sort of tension uh, that Meta, nay Facebook, was confronted with back in 2012. They wanted a way to create a view of the data uh, that wasn't maybe not reflective of what was available on the service. And there's also a tension that you see a lot when people are building clients. For, for example, on a, a iPhone or Android or that one person using Windows Mobile or whatever, there's lots of, lots of clients out there, and they all have particular use cases. And it would be a shame if for every client you had to go to the, uh, the implementation code and build a new service right, or build a new endpoint. So what they wanted to do is to make it so that the client could get as much or as little of the data as they wanted and get the job done that way. And so they introduced something called GraphQL. Right, so we've got that on the class path here, the Spring Boot Starter GraphQL, and uh, for our purposes, what we're going to do is we're going to create a schema file, right? Schema first, so schema.graphqls in the GraphQL folder here, and in GraphQL, you know, you can define uh, three verbs. There are three ways to describe data. Three verbs. One of them is called a query. These are for things that you want to read. Like I'm going to create a field in the type called query that returns a bracket, a bracket that's an array of customers. Okay, same thing for here. Same thing. I'm going to say name. String, I'm going to return an array of customers, OK? So these are fields, and this is a type. Queries are read operations. It's a well, this is a special type. It's a, a well-known type that uh, has, you know, it's, it's like other types, but it, it's where all your finder operations, all your methods, all your read operations will live. There are other verbs for subscriptions, which are like long-lived reads, and for mutations, which are everything else. Basically, anything you do to change data on the server side, you do with mutations. 
This is really convenient. I love this about this. There's no arguing about whether I should do HTTP uh, 201 or 200 or 202 with a location header. No arguing about whether it's put or post or patch. It just, it's just mutation, right? I, uh, no arguing with Rastafarians. Just go to production. Go home on time. It's great. So we have this query. Now I want to implement that query. And of course, I, I'm referencing a type here called customer. And we have that in our code base. But this isn't, strictly speaking, tied to that definition. Okay, So I'm going to create a type here in the schema. And I want to test that here as well. I'll say graphical enabled equals true. And I'll then restart this application. OK. Uh, Localhost 9090 forward slash graphical. Oop, there we go. So we have this nice little console that I enabled. You saw me enable it with that property in the property file here, right? So I'm saying enable the graphical console. Uh, and now I can go here and I can look. Look at that. Isn't that nice? Control space. All that work we did to teach HTTP and JSON endpoints about schema, you just get for free out of the box with GraphQL. Okay? So here we go. There's the data. I've got nothing there. I have to implement the controller to do that. Okay? And so what I want to do is I'm just going to create a simple controller, just like I would for any other thing in Spring that adapts a protocol to the business logic. Uh, and I'll use the controller annotation. So I'll inject my customer client. Okay? There we go. And we're going to create an endpoint that returns all the customers, right? Like this. Customers return this.cc.all. OK. Now, <clears throat> oop, come on. I've got this field here. Remember I said that there's also a, 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 you know, a by name. I could easily implement that as well. Um, let's see. If I go here, refresh, there's our data. It worked, of course, right? Very good. What about that? Just the ID, no problem. Get that, get that as well. You don't, the nice thing about this is I can get as much or as little data as I want. Now, what if I have another microservice? What, let's suppose that hypothetically I had another microservice that returned profile data, right? So profile, like your social media profile data, right? Your username and password or something like that. I don't have that microservice, but let's just suppose I did. Let's suppose I wanted to introduce that type here as well. So profile ID ID. And I want to now make it so that when you go and ask for the profile data for each customer, you can get it. It lives as part of the aggregate called customer. Okay, so there's the profile. Somehow I need to resolve that, but I have to call another microservice to get that information. Okay, well let's just implement that here. So we'll use a schema mapping. The type name will be customer. The root type will be customer, and I'm going to return profile. Okay. And of course, in order to resolve the profile for a given customer, I need a pointer to the customer. So I can just ask Spring GraphQL for that here. Uh, this dot, uh, and then I, and, you know, I can just return a new profile like this. I can say customer.id. OK, very simple. Let's just go ahead and restart that and see what that buys us. So I'm resolving parts of the graph. I have these, these schema resolvers, right? Uh, refresh, paste, profile. Now, of course, this isn't going to work. I need to specify a subfield like that. And if I do, you can see the profiles has the same ID as the customers. But what I've just done here is a little unfortunate. I've got an n plus 1 problem, don't I? If I have one call to get all the customers, then I have, and I have, I don't know, 10, if I have 10 customers, then I have 10 calls to get each profile. So I have 11 calls total. What we want to do is to make this more efficient. And so I can rewrite this to use batch mapping. OK? Whoops. So batch mapping uses the uh, GraphQL Java data loader behind the scenes. And the contract is, sorry, it's batch mapping. The contract here is given a customer, return the profile. So I say profile, and I get a pointer to all of the customers whose profiles we're trying to load, right, like this. So I, uh, OK, map good var map equals new hash map customer, whoop, custom, goodness. Customer profile for var c customer list map dot pc new profile c dot id return map. Okay, so this is just imagine you have a network call to another microservice where you can say select all from profile where customer id in this range of customers. Okay, very simple, but I'm doing it in memory here. The point is, I have the same exact response. The client does not need to be any the wiser of what just happened here, right? GraphQL makes it very easy for us to create the view of the data that they need to support their use cases, and we can architect it as efficiently or inefficiently as we need up front behind the scenes. This is a really good deal. And of course, if they don't ask for the profile, then that method doesn't get called. There's no cost, right? It's free if you don't use it. All right, my friends. Good. We talked about it a number of different ways to build services more production worthy. 
We looked at new features in Spring Boot 3.0 and 3.1 coming out this month, May, right? Later this month, Spring Boot 3.1 will be here with the new test containers and Docker Compose support. We looked at Gravium native images. We looked at the new baselines, Java 17 and Jakarta EE, both awesome. We looked at, uh, you know, all the uh, cool stuff around Micrometer, the new updates there. We looked at a lot of stuff. Who learned something new? Good stuff. Who had fun? Who had fun? Right on. Good stuff. I want to thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my friend Alina Yurenko uh, and I are going to be doing a talk this... Uh, Tomorrow. To no, Thursday or Friday? Friday. 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 We're going to be doing a, talk, a deep dive on all the AOT, Gravium, uh, uh, the engine, the whole thing. It's going to be a lot of fun. Really, really, you know, bring your, bring your uh, pencils and papers and your noteboards, though, okay? Thank you so much, my friends. Appreciate it. Have a great, wonderful day.